Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 34. Today's episode is a conversation with educator, facilitator, and poet Emily Ligren. Emily is the co-author of the book How to Teach Nature Journaling, which she wrote along with John Muir Laws. Emily has a perspective on nature journaling that's really unique. As an environmental educator, her work involves making science accessible to young people, and she helps them connect with scientific thinking. She's also a poet. And this other way of experiencing the natural world through poetic language and poetic thinking also informs her work and her teaching. She brings these two seemingly opposite things together effortlessly and she lets them dance in a joy-filled way. After you listen to this conversation, you'll understand exactly what I mean. Emily, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm feeling very, very lucky and excited to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Beth, and I'm so excited to get to talk to you as well. (laughs) Now, there's some things I want to talk to you about, childhood and getting into nature journaling, but I want to start with a poem, if that's okay. And I think you've got one to read for us. I do. This poem is called Ritual. In each new place, I look at the leaves to help me arrive. Some are gray and withered, others gold or green. The round spots of fungi, insect holes, split lines along veins all say, I have been here long enough for here to change me. May I stay half as long? (laughs) You've given me goosebumps. I've read this one of yours before and I'm glad you chose it to read because I, it's powerful and yeah, thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you. So let's start at the the beginning. I, I love to chat with my guests about early nature experiences and because I think that often exposure to nature in childhood raises up someone who loves nature as an adult. And I'm wondering about your early nature experiences. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was very lucky. My parents, my mom and my dad, um, both took me outside in my lot, me, me and my sister outside a lot. Um, and I grew up in a pretty rural area, you know, in, in Monterey County, um, on the central coast of California. So I just had a lot of memories of being outside by myself um, and having just kind of this quiet that I could access um, in that time outside. And I also had some really great teachers in middle school, one science teacher in particular, who um, just really supported us to spend time outside and would give us a bunch of binoculars and say, okay, go tell me what birds you can find in the next hour or Mm -hmm. um, had us collecting insects or making observations. And um, all of those experiences really made being outside an important part of developing who I was and also an important part of kind of my grounding as a poet and, um, you know, interest in science, interest in being an educator, wanting to share that and share those experiences together with people. Mm. For me, I hear two things in that. The first one is about um, nature experiences alone. And I think that this is something there's, there's nature experiences and then there's just being out there as a child in the wildness of it all by yourself. And for me, that was really significant. And the second thing is about mentors. You mentioned your parents, you mentioned teachers and these people that really can shape you or or gently direct you (laughs) in a certain way. Tell me about mentors in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, again, just feel very grateful and lucky to have had many, you know, many mentors who have supported me throughout my time, um, including Jack, who, you know, was, was someone who I met kind of um, at important, an important time in my career when I was still in college and I was kind of studying um, geology, academics. I had great professors in college, but I didn't really want to be in academics. 
Um, and Jack and other uh, folks that I met at the San Francisco Sierra Nevada Field Campus here, um, including Sarah Rabkin, who's a phenomenal nature journaler, um, Andy Thrams, who's an amazing artist, um, Jack Laws as well. They were all these adults who had kind of professions focused on nature and being outside, but they weren't um, academic scientists. And they've all been really important mentors for me in terms of kind of both modeling just through doing the work that they do in the world and also mm. um, by supporting me to, to find my own way. Mm. I'd love to learn more about that. So you studied in college and so now you're an environmental educator, you're a poet, you're a facilitator, and you have your own work in environmental education. I'd love to learn more about the trajectory of how you got to where you are, the the environmental educator that you are today. I, um, after college, I, I started working at a residential outdoor science school, which there are many of these programs um, across the United States and also um, in many other countries as well. Um, and so students would come and stay where I lived for four or five days, and my job would be to spend time with them outside every day and teach science uh -huh. every day. Um, and that was this incredible experience of getting to have these really joyful, meaningful um, times with students in the outdoors, finding, you know, cool insects, mm -hmm. um, turning over rocks, just like lying on a hillside and, and being present together. Um, and while I was doing that, I got in, I was kind of approached or connect, got connected with the Beatles Project from the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley here. Um, and it was a fairly new project at the time. And at that point in my time as an environmental educator, I was pretty new at it. And I like knew I wanted to be better at it, but I didn't really know how. There was this way that I had kind of been, had been modeled to me to teach in a pretty entertaining way where it was like mm -hmm. kind of about, um, you know, being the star and, and, you know, taking up space a lot as an educator, um, a lot of gimmicks, and it just never felt right to kind of me and how I, I like to relate to kids. And I ran into the Beatles Project, and they were taking everything that we know about kind of brain science and neuroscience and how people learn and applying that to outdoor education. Um, and it really changed my world as a teacher and facilitator um, mm. and as a learner. Um, it, it was based on this model of learning that, you know, science is a process and way of knowing and figuring things out. And so often science is misrepresented as a collection of facts that you have to memorize. And if you're good mm -hmm. at memorizing facts, you're good at science. And in fact, learning is this far more complex, joyful process um, that we can engage in with students. We can be co-learners with students. Um, co-investigators is often how Beatles talks about it. Um, and so getting to learn from the Beatles Project and be a residential outdoor science educator at the same time was really powerful for building my skills as an educator um, because I would learn something new about leading discussions and you know working as a facilitator and then I would get to practice it every week I would have a new group of students and would get the opportunity um, to try things out and work on myself and really reflect deeply as an educator on how I was engaging students and how I could improve um, and so I that is, is a big part of what made me the educator who I am today. And kind of continuing to work with the Beatles Project since then has been a really deep place of learning, um, not only about teaching and, and also just learning about kind of the dynamics of the environmental education community being, you know, a pretty homogenous community in terms of race, being a pretty white community and reflecting yes. on um, what's caused that and reflecting on kind of the role that white educators need to play um, in shifting those dynamics over time. So um, all of that's to say it's been a constant uh, process of growth and learning and reflection being an educator. I think that's what I love most about being an educator is that um, it's essential to be growing myself. Um, it's essential to be reflecting constantly on how I'm showing up and what that does to a learning space um, and that's an incredible opportunity to, to be continuing to get to grow and learn all the time. Yeah, that's so valuable. It's so beautiful that you talk about learning with the students because each, each opportunity when you're out in nature, is it's nature's providing you in the moment unique opportunities. You know, here's 
this caterpillar doing this particular thing in this moment and you can be with that particular thing. It's not like top down, this is our lesson today, we're going to fill out this worksheet. It's it's more organic than that. It's 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 learning together and I absolutely love that. And I love also what you talked about um, bringing in or reflecting on the state of the environmental education movement at the moment and why it is what it is. I was reading a blog post that was on the Beatles website and it was called Partnering to Develop Equitable, Inclusive and Culturally Relevant Student Activities. And this blog post talks about the process of analysing every part of the organisation and your activities to be sure that they're equitable, inclusive and culturally relevant. And I just think this is so wonderful and so important. And I think that all of us, every person, every educator especially, could benefit from looking deeply at our own ways of operating, figuring out how we can change the inbuilt biases that we have that unintentionally exclude people. And one of the examples that really struck me was really simple. You said that you had an activity called walk and talk and someone that the outside auditors told you, but what about people who can't walk? What about people who can't talk? And I don't think before I read that, that I would have ever thought about that, how that, yeah, that is ableist language and so easy to do, so easy to to say without consciously thinking about that. Tell me about that process of like analysing the Beatles project and and what you found there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say. I feel like that could be a whole other podcast right. interview. <laughs> um, and I think like a really key keyword there is partnering um, and mm -mm. reflecting on how within our team we didn't have the expertise really, you know, to be evaluating our curriculum from that lens. Um, having a primarily white team, and we worked with several different community partners, um, including Jose Gonzalez, founder of Latino Outdoors, really incredible leader. If you want to learn and think more about these issues, issues he's a great person to follow on yes. Instagram. Um, and also Youth Outside, which are local here in, in Oakland and are nationally recognized as leaders in the field in terms of working towards a more equitable and inclusive and diverse field of outdoor education. Um, and we, you know, invited them to uh, offer feedback on our approaches and, and really, you know, listened um, and took in that feedback. And there were many things like walk and talk, um, like kind of using language that assumes that students come to a learning experience without observation skills that they already mm -hmm. have, kind of assuming that we're imparting all this wisdom um, and, you know, using language that reinforces the idea that the instructor is the expert, even though that wasn't our philosophy as a program, kind of unintentionally reinforcing yes. these, these dynamics. Um, so I think a really critical piece is um, forming partnerships and forming mutually beneficial partnerships um, where there's kind of support and a relationship grown out of mutual trust and respect, which, which takes time. Yeah. That's that's wonderful for all of us to reflect on, I think. Yeah. I'm wondering when nature journaling, as we know it, fits into all this. Does How did you come to nature journaling? I've kept a journal for a lot of my life um, and have done kind of writing and, and little sketches for a lot of my life in terms of the, like, current iteration of nature journaling of, of what we kind of see in the uh, national and international community. I was working at a field campus and, and doing a lot of writing in my journal. Um, and Jack Laws came to teach a, a class there. Um, and this was, you know, kind of a long time ago, maybe, gosh, like 12 or 13 years ago at this point. Um, and the way that he talked about drawing in his journal as a way of kind of accessing wonder and curiosity was how I felt about writing. Um, and we, you know, started conversing and, and started collaborating in terms of kind of thinking about how journaling could include both of those components in a really deep way uh, to support learning and thinking. But that was when I really started drawing, kind of not having used that a lot as a tool before that um, and mm -hmm. kind of having a hesitation around wanting to try it since it's not, you know, kind of primarily what I'm inclined towards. Um, and after, you know, nature journaling for 
12 or 13 years, it's really interesting to notice the development in my own style um, to kind of include more drawing and to just kind of always find my way back to poetry and writing. Mm. Um, I can kind of intentionally in my journal focus on, you know, drawing and asking questions and all these things. And what most often happens is I'll start a quick sketch um, and a poem will kind of emerge from that act of being deeply present and deeply quiet that can come from from drawing and nature journaling. That's beautiful. And I'd really love to go down that path because poetry is something I have always loved and always I find reading poetry, listening to poetry, really deeply connective, like a, an act that's really visceral, really emo- emotional, emotive. And yet as a nature journal community, I feel like the art side gets the focus and I, th- I would love to see more focus on poetry, more focus on words and writing uh, in in nature journaling. And yeah, I'd love for us to talk a little bit more about poetry, how you got into poetry. What what were your first experiences, your first memories of poetry? I mean, it circles back to that being alone as a kid outside mm-hmm. um, and having this experience of, of just being quiet and having words arise. Um, and that's still like that quiet is still something that I, that I chase. It's harder to find as an adult with like internet and things and jobs and, <laughs> and all of that. But when I'm able to really get quiet, um, there, there's just so much to notice. And in terms of writing poetry, um, it feels really resonant actually, you know, with, with drawing or other kind of ways of being mindful and present. Um, it comes back to noticing, you know, I notice mm-hmm. how wonder it reminds me of, which is, you know, foundational to Beatles, foundational to nature journaling. Um, if you can just kind of stick with that noticing, looking at things that you, you can see or perceive through any senses, um, the sensations that you touch, and just start writing it down in nature. And then kind of the, the joy of poetry for me is then turning that noticing inward. Um, what's it like to be holding the leaf? What's it like to be, you know, running your finger over the veins and feeling the textures? What's it like to be noticing the moss that, you know, covers this tree, covers the cracks in the bark of a tree? What it's, What is it like to, um, you know, ask a question that you've never asked before? And poetry to me is really just putting those things onto the page um, in addition to what we're noticing about our surroundings. I spoke with Jack about this actually when in our interview I asked him because I loved in the book How to Teach Nature Journaling that you turn these prompts. Everyone uses these prompts. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of we use these prompts to um, focus our attention on what we're experiencing in the world and I love that you turn those inward. So I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of inside, inside myself. And I asked Jack about this and he said, isn't that brilliant? It was all Emily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's really a powerful tool for social emotional learning too, which you know is kind of gaining more prominence in in schools here. Um, and if we're kind of thinking thinking back towards um, identifying bias and and reflecting on our roles as educators, um, that's actually a tool that I use for myself when I you know when I notice resistance or notice discomfort. You know, what am I noticing about what's going mm-hmm. on for me right now? Like, what does this remind me of? Um, and those tools are, are just so powerful, so foundational for writing, for, um, you know, reflecting on what it means to be human, for going outside and, and noticing what's in front of us. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about social emotional learning? I, I'd love to hear you speak about that a little bit more, what it is and how it's practiced. Yeah, I mean, it's something I'm really excited about, and I'm also by no means an expert in it. Um, there's a lot of great places to learn more about that. Um, and it's it's like funny that it's called this thing, social-emotional learning, as if it's like separate from everything Sep- else mm-hmm. that's happening. Um, but it's often taught as kind of competencies for being aware of ourselves, for being, you know, mindful as we're engaging socially, um, you know, things like, managing stress or managing tasks, 
um, things like having a sense of responsibility to ourselves and our communities and reflecting on what that looks like to behave in right relationship with that. Um, those are all kind of competencies of social emotional learning. And there are many different organizations in the United States that are working to kind of integrate that more into um, academic schooling. And I'm a big proponent of the idea that there's like no learning that's not social emotional yes. learning. Like we're here having this conversation. I'm having a social and emotional experience right now. Yes. Um, we're both using skills um, of navigating those interactions and paying attention to you know what's going on for us at the same time. Um, and so I've actually developed a, an activity with the Beatles Project with some support from Nature Bridge, which is a really well-known environmental education uh, organization here. Um, that actually sets up before like a science or after education experience has a conversation about social emotional learning. What are the skills as we're gonna, you know, that we're going to need as a group to succeed in this science investigation? Mm. And talking about listening to one another or listening with curiosity, talking about managing physical tools, like you know, making sure that we're, we're sharing materials with one another. Um, and I found I found that to be a really powerful frame with students to have those conversations and kind of bring in this element of reflecting on how we're engaging with one another in a learning experience and also engaging with the land, with the place that we're in. Yeah, that's beautiful. So one of the major foundations of nature journaling, but also the work you do with beetles, is curiosity. And I love... I love that idea of being curious interpersonally as well. And I think that when you practice that with, when you practice curiosity in nature journaling, it builds curiosity in all areas of life, including curiosity just with each other. And I think that's something that would easily and beautifully grow out of the programs that you do, just curiosity in connecting with each other what's this person thinking what's this person <laughs> what's next you know what's the what are they going to say and listening with curio curiosity I think that's a beautiful and powerful thing mm -hmm. and I appreciate what, you, what you're saying about nature journaling as a way to kind of cultivate that skill because it is a skill um, our brains aren't necessarily designed to be curious about things they're designed to process information pretty quickly actually um, and so to have the tools to slow down and be curious, to slow down, notice, and then make space for many possible reactions or many possible pathways to go down um, is a really joyful and, and amazing thing to cultivate um, in, in all areas of our lives, as you were saying. Yeah. Tell me, do you have favorite poets? Do you, you write poetry? Do you read poetry a lot? Do you have favorite poets or people who inspire you? Oh, yes, I have so many favorite poets. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love reading poetry. I, I um, will recite poems in the morning often just to kind of get poetry into my body, um, mm. into into my speaking voice. But um, a couple of poets who I really love, who, you know, I feel like their work really resonates with this conversation that we're having. Um, one is Naomi Shihab Nye. She's one of my favorite poets. And she, her work is incredible um, and just has this way of um, relating to the world from a place of really genuine curiosity um, and hope and attention. Um, Jericho Brown is a really tremendous writer writing in the United States. Um, would highly recommend his work. Um, Kim Stafford, who's William Stafford's son, is an amazing poet and really amazing teaching teacher of poetry if you're looking for someone to learn that from. Wonderful. Um, yeah, those are a few to start with, and there's just many, many more wonderful poets. I love that. I'll, I'll put some links to your favorite poets in the show notes for this episode so others can follow up with that because I think learning about poets you might not have heard of or poets that inspire others is, is a great activity. So thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about this amazing book you've co-authored, How to Teach Nature Journaling. And firstly, I just want to say congratulations. This book is amazing, it, like foundational. It's so, it's the go-to for, for everyone. And it was such a joy to watch it come out. And yeah, so congratulations, firstly. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're finding it to be useful. 
Did you see the videos that came out at that time when it was released, people racing to their mailboxes to open the parcels? <laughs> I did. That was... <laughs> That was really fun. That like that made me really happy and was it was really meaningful actually because it was pretty early in the pandemic and it was like a really strange time to to you know release a book, um, and getting to see those videos was really that that really was meaningful to me. <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, I'm interested to um, to talk about your relationship with John Muir Laws and how your because you have. Um, previously co-authored a curriculum with Jack, um, opening the world through nature journaling, and and now the book. I'd love to talk first about how that relationship developed. You mentioned that you met and he was very focused on art, you were very focused on poetry, and so those two maybe were two sides of of the story which beautifully came together. But I'd love to hear your story about how it all started yeah I mean that relationship grew and that was you know I was I was new to being an educator and Jack was also just very supportive to me in pursuing education as a path and and kind of being a cheerleader and in you know encouraging me to just keep going down that path so I I really appreciate that um, support from him and the opportunity to kind of teach and collaborate and be in conversation um, we ended up doing a lot of workshops for teachers together since, you know, kind of education was a common interest that we both had too. Um, and there was just a lot of development and evolution of kind of how we were thinking about using nature journaling with students that happened over the years. Um, and part of that development was kind of more deeply integrating drawing and writing together as opposed to being kind of these two separate things that you might do on the page really thinking about how can they inform one another and bringing in you know mathematical thinking which Jack is really strong in as well um, and getting to teach teacher workshops and and you know getting to be engaging in these conversations with um, educators and kind of the new book we when we finished the first curriculum um, opening the world through nature journaling which Jack had published previously we kind of did another edition of it there were like already more ideas about using nature journaling with students <laughs> um, and there were the next generation science standards that came out in the United States which are actually very bold progressive standards um, and those really pushed my thinking in, in terms of working with beetles and understanding more kind of developing science scientific thinking skills is a really critical component um, to this work and so that were that was some of the things that really informed the development of of this most recent book Um, and also just being at workshops and getting asked similar questions kind of time after time like how do you give feedback on on student journals Um, you know like what do you do if this happens we we really wanted to take the expertise that we both developed in terms of doing journaling with a lot of students and be able to offer that in a way that was really accessible um, to support educators to to do this with their students. That's the wonderful thing about the book is that it's very clear, very step by step. What do you do when you need to give feedback to someone? And and you explain that in the book and it's really um, just super useful and like troubleshooting things that might come up and step-by-step instructions. It's a wonderful, wonderful book you've created. Yeah, thank you. Um, And it was really, you know, it's very much a collaboration. And Jack has, you know, just had so, so many years of of doing nature journaling and teaching nature journaling and has this kind of like magic with kids that he's he's able to kind of cultivate in terms of um, thinking about how how to support kids to be engaged. So there's just a lot of of love and expertise went into that book Mm. Mm. and it really comes through yeah this idea of teaching teachers I think is so valuable because you know in terms of Jack talks about his work being like the idea that if you teach someone to be in love with nature they'll be stewards in the future and if you teach teachers to teach more people like he said it's a magnifier you're going to um, spread this important message further and faster. So that is a wonderful reason to um, to create a teaching the teachers resource like you have done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
So nature journaling crosses so many curriculum areas, science, maths, art, language, and even physical education, like when you're out climbing through the woods. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this, about how this one amazing activity can just cross so many academic areas. Yeah, I I really appreciate that you asked that question, Bethan, because it's, I mean, I think what's really incredible about it is how flexible it is. Um, and how the journal page really invites the creativity of the learner um, in terms of, you know, how much writing is on the page versus drawing, Um, in terms of the fonts that you use or the way, you know, that you you structure things on the page, in terms of what you focus on even. Um, And I think the, the flexibility is actually a really critical part of teaching it. Um, And yes, something that I talk about a lot kind of when I think about offering journaling to to learners is kind of having the right amount of structure. Um, And if there's too much structure, if it's like a worksheet that's fill in the blanks, there's no space for that creativity. There's no space for the thinking. There's no space for the drawing, the kind of noticing, the deep, you know, writing, engaging with all those different methods. Um, And having no structure can also be challenging if nature journaling is is new to you. Um, Saying, you know, okay, go journal now without yes. any further direction if you've never done it before can be intimidating. I think especially because so many kids and adults have had experiences where they were told either you can't draw, you can't write, you can't do math. Um, and so hitting the sweet spot of structure is really critical, um, which I think of as having first a part of nature to focus on, kind of narrowing the field a little bit and saying, you're going to look at this tree or we're going to look at these puddles. Um, having a focus for your observations, which are essentially what all the activities in the book are, like comparison, like zooming in or zooming out, like making a map, and that kind of focuses the observations even further, and then offering some ideas about how to put down information on the page, like here's how you could incorporate drawing and writing together, here's how the numbers can inform it. Um, And that's a simple structure, but there's like this idea that constraint can be freeing if it's not too constrained. Yes. Yes. Um, Yeah. And I I think of it as like kind of this mosaic of like so many different possible nature journal pages that you could create. There's endless possibilities of kind of mixing and matching those those different pieces. Um, And there's potential to, you know, journal about things that aren't, you know, quote unquote nature, which I, you know, am of the mind that nature's everywhere and always around us. Yes. but it's this flexible set of skills that's underneath the interaction of those three, um, those three languages. There's this set of skills of being able to follow and develop curiosity um, and shine a light on something that's interesting to you and focus on it and let yourself be surprised. Um, that's really the tools of a resilient and flexible learner. Um, and that's what's so deeply exciting to me about this medium um, is kind of that it's not just doing a drawing, it's not just writing a poem, it's kind of these um, things that inform each other deeply and and invite us to go more deep with all of our subjects. I love that if you have a group and you ask them to do the same activity, every journal page is completely different. I, I think that's just such a beautiful aspect of it because we are different as human beings. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate that perspective too. And that's, you know, that's something that I'll often share with students is highlighting, you know, look, we all did it differently. And that's all like, that's great. That's what makes this a rich learning community. Again, to the social emotional experience where we're learning that we are our own people. And at the same time, we're experiencing the same thing. We learn, we learn from each other because we're different, but also we have, we have a heart, we have, we have human experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is a really, I, I'm glad you said that about kind of having the human experiences, because I think inviting that onto the page is actually really important. Um, and it's something that we're reflecting a lot in Beatles is how do we honor the expertise that our learners are bringing to an experience? Mm-hmm. How do we show them that their observations and ideas are central to the learning process, not, you know, something that's on the side. 
um, yes. but a really critical critical thing that informs the group's learning and supports the group's learning. Um, and that's part of why with a group of students, I love to kind of journal early on in the experience and then keep returning to those journal entries um, as we go throughout, you know, and kind of look back and keep talking about our observations and keep, you know, kind of drilling down. Um, it shows them, you know, hey, that stuff you put on the journal page, that's, that's what we're focused on. That's um, those ideas that you had, um, the experiences from your life that you wrote down on the page are informing our conversation too. Yeah. In Nature Journal, let's go a bit deeper with this. So in Nature Journaling workshops, we encourage students to use the three languages, like you mentioned, words, pictures, and numbers. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit deeper about like wh why, why do you think using a combination of these three ways of communicating is so powerful and rich on a, on a nature journal page? What's the educational benefit and the, and the reason for using these three particular languages in tandem? Yeah, thanks for clarifying that question a little bit. Um, I think they're so powerful in combination because the process of using them all at once leads you to think differently than just using one of them. Um, and drawing has so much to offer in terms of supporting memory, in terms of you know how closely you have to look at something to draw it. It really forces your brain to engage in a way that is hard to do if you're not drawing something. Looking at kind of the angle of the stem from the branch or kind of focusing on, on these really um, subtle details can lead you to make really significant observations in terms of ecology and biology and understanding something. Um, and writing leads you to externalize your thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of brain research about how externalizing our thinking by talking or writing is really significant for actually understanding what we're thinking um, and kind of looking critically at it. Um, and taking a moment to write down a sentence that's in my mind forces me to clarify my thoughts more deeply. Um, and often for me personally leads me kind of down a train of thought that I might not have gone in as deeply if I weren't writing. Um, yes. Another really cool way that writing can support the process um, is by descriptive language. Um, if something's really hard to draw, like a bunch of hairs, um, you know, on, on some moss, <laughs> you can use words to, you know, enhance the drawing. Um, and thinking about that kind of communication is, is really critical for kind of visual literacy and, and thinking about communication. Um, and numbers, there's a quote from Todd Newberry, who's a, a professor of marine biology at University of California, Santa Cruz. He says, if you want to ask questions, start counting. Um, mm. And there, isn't that a great quote? Yeah. Um, and there's this way that starting to count things or use numbers to quantify um, gives you data that is just on a really different level than written information or drawn information. Mm. And it reveals patterns that can lead to all sorts of interesting questions and ideas. Oh, so cool. So Jack often talks about his own dyslexia and how it made things difficult in school for him. Academia wasn't a safe or comfortable place for him and he, he found solace in nature. And I was reading a blog post that you wrote about how in school you were labelled smart and academic. Academia was safe and comfortable for you. You you could be a good in school like the teachers um, wanted you to be. But you even though you ticked all the boxes academically, this had its own issues for you for self-esteem, self um self-confidence, it reinforces reinforced a fixed mindset and patterns of self-criticism. And I'm really interested that these two ways of learning in Jack and in yourself have come together and I'm interested about that. So you've co authored this book, you've created these lesson plans, resources for young people to connect with nature journaling. I wonder if you have any thoughts about this, about how nature journaling, this activity, can be so valuable for people who learn in completely different ways, who have different learning styles and different learning needs and and still be the perfect activity for, for everyone coming from different learning perspectives. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that question and, and to share kind of a little more about my background in, in elementary school. I was I was really good at school. Um I you know, it was and that was something that I heard a lot from adults, like, Oh, you're really good, you're really smart. Um, you can do your times tables really fast. Um and at that young age that meant that I got an idea that like that's what learning was, was being mm -hmm. able to memorize things and, you know, be able to recite them back um, and that gave me an inaccurate picture of what learning was um, and then when I came to a point in my academic career when I was asked to think critically I really struggled because I didn't have those skills and because I had this idea that um, I was smart and good because I couldn't succeed academically in this critical thinking context that shook my confidence in a really deep place because I had this fixed mm. mindset, inflexible idea of what it meant to be a learner, you know, focused on memorizing facts and not on kind of being a resilient, creative thinker. Um, and so getting to Nature Journal and getting to work with the Beatles Project and teach and learn more about what learning actually is um, was this really deeply healing experience for me where I realized um, it was okay to not know the answer. In fact, that's like really fun and, and joyful. Um, and that my nature journal was a tool I could use to learn. And that learning didn't have to be about memorization. And I, I wasn't a failure if I didn't know the answer right away. Um, and so I think a lot of my goal as an educator is to offer skills that learners can use to continue to learn in their life. And nature journaling is a set of many powerful skills. Um, and it's flexible, and you can lean on the skills that are most comfortable or interesting to you. If you're more interested in drawing, you can draw more. If you're more interested in writing, you can write more. If you're really into numbers, um, you can lean on that. Uh, and so I think for learners coming from really different backgrounds and with different skills, it's an important message to first say, you know, hey, that skill that you're kind of intimidated by, you can get better at it, and doing it will help you get better, and you get to choose which skills you really want to focus on. Um, I think, like, there's a way that having a growth mindset can make it seem like you have to get better at everything, um, or, like, because you have a growth mindset, you have to work on all the skills at once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is like not not possible, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I like that nature journaling allows for learners, you know, young and adult learners to be able to, you know, find what they love within that process yes. of being in nature and being outside to relate to it in a way that feels good to them, you know, whatever that looks like on the page. And to have the opportunity to um, kind of push yourself and, and develop skills that are maybe not um, as innate to you or, or are harder to learn and trust that you can get better at those if you want to and that you can use this flexible tool in a way that really excites you to learn cool things um, about whatever's around us. Yeah, there's so much in that. And I think the key is that when that it's not a formula. I mean, you you are there to provide scaffolding. As a teacher, you're there to provide scaffolding to explore with curiosity, with excitement, with joy and wonder. And these academic things just fall into place. Like someone who's very academically minded doesn't have to feel like this is a test I'm going to be I'm not smart if I don't do this, 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 because it's not about that. It's just about playing and finding wonder and excitement and joy and the academics flows from that. And someone who is not academically minded, someone, for example, who has dyslexia or has a learning difference, they also just come at it with play and excitement and curiosity. And it also just flows out of them because because that's the way it goes. And yeah. I think that's beautiful and really important. Yeah, um, and really important, you know, as well, that 
what we kind of call being good at academics is actually a pretty narrow skill set and is like not, yes. you know, in my opinion, at least like not the most valuable yes. um, or important skill set to, to develop. Um, yeah, there's a lot kind of, there's a lot I could say about the way that having a rigid identity as you're a child, whether it's around something that's positive or negative, um, can kind of be a really challenging thing to shake when you get older. Um, and I appreciate that nature journaling is a, is a tool that shook that for me personally. And I, I've heard from other people similar stories that um, it helped them push through a barrier that they, you know, a block they had of, of being told they weren't good at art in, in high school or of yes. being told they couldn't write um, and kind of being this ground to try out different ways of being and, and see how we can use them to learn and, and, and be joyful. Yeah. Your work is really centered around a commitment to building a more connected world. I love this so much. It really resonates with me. So your work is bringing people closer to themselves, to each other, to their communities, to nature. I think this is one of the most essential reasons for doing this work. And I deeply appreciate you for doing that. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that about connection, about what it means personally for us as human beings, as learners, and what it means for the world when we become connected, what that means in terms of flow on into the world. Yeah, I think one, one thing that I think about in relation to connection is nature journaling and poetry and science, all these different ways of thinking as, as processes of inquiry that help us to know ourselves better or help us to know the world that we're in better. And we were talking about this earlier in terms of having curiosity about people in addition yes. to, um, to you know, the outdoors, the natural world. And I, for me, that's been so transformative in my life to move through the world with this kind of open heartedness, um, with a sense that to try to build connection is a really important goal and it's worth taking the time to do yes. and that moving from this place of observing and being open to curiosity and open to being surprised leads to connection can lead to connection when there's a willingness to be genuinely curious when there's a willingness to pay quality attention when there's a willingness to share yourself on a journal page yes. or in a poem those kinds of activities can support connection between communities, between people, between people and themselves, between people and land. Um, and those connections are, are the types of things that I really want to be supporting with my work. Mm. I read a blog post of yours and it's called Ask Me for a Poem. And I just love this. <laughs> I'd love to talk <laughs> about it. So you, you got in the habit of wearing a, a necklace inscribed with the words ask me for a poem yeah and I'd love to hear you talk about this because it just made me so happy to to hear it to read this yeah uh, I started doing that several years ago if I'm at a gathering or a festival or some place where there's a lot of people and I have that sign ask me for a poem and people will come up and I say like hey can I have a poem yeah. And I have a sheet of paper where I've written different themes of poems, things like love or grieving or nature or teaching. And I invite the person to choose a category of poem they want to hear. And I have maybe between 50 and 100 poems memorized or close to memorized. And I have them on a sheet of paper, all these poems uh, printed out on sheets of paper, which is something that um, I borrowed from Jack, kind of meeting him early on. And I've organized the poems into that, those categories, and I'll recite a poem that fits with the category the person wanted to hear. And related to building connection, it often leads to a really authentic connection, because someone will ask for a theme that connects to something that's important to them in the moment. And yeah. I love I love that practice of kind of having a visual invitation to say like, hey, come, come talk I'm to open. me. 
Yeah, I'm yeah. open. I, f- I feel that is just so powerful for the reason that I've had this experience as I've gotten older that of just realising that the vast, vast majority of human beings are kind-hearted, gentle, open, loving and and wonderful. And when you move through the world with this mindset, with this ability to to connect in that way or to realize that people that you encounter are are just gentle lovely people and when you meet a stranger and you share a poem and maybe they ask you for a poem about grieving because they've just lost someone or they've just finished a relationship or something it's it's a vulnerable moment and it's a moment with someone who you don't know but you know deeply in another way because because we because of our shared experience and because most people are genuinely just lovely people and I don't know I feel really moved by that about your openness and willingness just to see someone see someone that you've never met before and see them in a really vulnerable beautiful way so yeah thank you for sharing that I think it's amazing Thank you. It's something I'm I'm missing doing right now during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, I'm missing those opportunities for for connection with strangers like that. Mm-hmm. I'm so interested in you, Emily, because <laughs> because you have these two sides of yourself. You're a poet. You're deeply connected with the inner life, the emotional side, and you're also a teacher of scientific thinking. Someone who makes science accessible to young people. I'm interested about this, the overlap. What for you is the overlap between these two sides of your work? And I'm wondering your thoughts on whether science and emotion can coexist or are they in separate compartments for you? Yeah, I I really appreciate this question. They feel very coexistent for me. Mm -hmm. I would also really recommend reading the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Yes. And she's such a treasure. And she talks a lot about kind of the the necessity, actually, of emotion or kind of deeper principles guiding scientific work. And I think Mm -hmm. that's a really important perspective she brings to the scientific community. For myself and my own experience, when I'm out kind of being present in the outdoors in the world, it just feels like two really fun, different toys that I could choose to play with. Mm. I could choose to go down kind of a more scientific r- route of asking questions, and that's a pretty fast process for me. I'm looking out the window at some moss growing on a tree and noticing, oh, interesting, there isn't any growing up where these sap sucker holes are, and I wonder if that's true on other trees. I wonder if I were to get there out there and look at it, I would see anything that would conflict with that evidence, you know, kind of this fast analytical process. Or I can kind of approach it as a poet and move a little slower and reach a little farther um, and let whatever comes onto the page be, you know, be coming from many different places. Um, And I I find so much joy in being able to move back and forth between those perspectives Mm -hmm. to have them also inform one another, to have science inform what I'm writing in my poetry or to have my kind of sense of poetics and poetic thinking inform science and it feels actually very easy and effortless to be able to hold those together and I think they offer complementary ways of looking at the world. They're both processes of inquiry for me. They're different in what they focus on and I think they're both critically important. Mm, I agree and it's something that comes to mind is that if um you know, as we move into this new world of technology and robotics and who knows what else, if science were led by the heart in a strong way, we're going to make better, clearer decisions that are going to keep us safe from technology or or these things running away with us. You know, I, I mean, scientific ethics and, and whatnot need to be guided by the heart, I think. I don't know, that just came to mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's important 
science is often talked about as a place where we need to be objective. Mm. And I don't think we ever can be truly objective. Yeah. That's not that's not what our little human bodies are. Yes. <laughs> and I uh, yeah, I I would I for any any listeners out there who haven't read Braiding the Sweetgrass. Yes. That book offers so many valuable ways of of thinking about kind of bringing in that kind of guidance to science it said so beautifully um I, it's it's yes. an incredible work robin wall Kimmerer's energy is just so gentle so loving like she's loving of nature but she's loving of humanity as well and yeah i'll, I'll link her book in the show notes as well i think it's a really valuable important work so thank you for bringing that up Sometimes I talk on the podcast about nature journaling from the head or the heart, and I don't know why I started asking this, but I, I'm just interested in it. And I'm interested. Some people straight away say head. I'm all about the head. Some people say all about the heart. And I guess maybe you've even answered this already, but I wonder about that specifically. What's your response to that? Do you nature journal from the head or the heart? Yeah, I love that question. And it feels it feels really connected to my response to the last question. It feels yes, like both yes. are both are there, and sometimes one more than the other. But it's often a conscious choice of of which space I'm I'm going to try to live in for the purpose of of what I'm trying to do for what my goal is yes. in the moment. Yes, I really appreciate that, and I think being able to turn on like we we talked about how curiosity or building curiosity is something you cultivate, something that you practice. And I think living from the heart can be something you practice as well and that you can focus on it. I've spoken before about I feel like my heart is a sense organ in, in mm. that I can do this sensory awareness, I can focus on my vision, I can focus on what I'm hearing, and I can also focus here on what I'm feeling and – and I notice that when I do that, when I build that ability to focus on my heart, what am I feeling in this moment? And I can also put it on something so I can say, I can look at a bug on a leaf or something. And instead of like, what am I seeing about this bug? It's like, what do I feel right here about this bug? And it grows. It's something that grows. And it, I like what you said about how you can put your focus on it. You can focus on your scientific thinking. You can also focus inward on the heart. And I find that too. And I, I really appreciate that you said that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I wonder if you could share one more poem before we finish. I've just loved this conversation so much. And I'd love to end with one more poem from you, if that's okay. Yeah, I would love to read another one. And I, I really appreciate um, everything that you have done for the nature journaling community and how you continue to support conversation and dialogue and connection both in your in your home area in Australia and also all around the world. Oh, thanks so much, Emily. Yeah. Okay. Apid. I saw 10 dead bees on my walk today. 10 small bodies lying on their sides or backs they're still wings and smaller somehow. How many flowers did that soft face push into? How many pollen grains static to the intricate forest of hairs on one leg? Have you ever seen a bee up close when it was alive, I mean? Look the next chance you get. You will see its abdomen swell and contract with breath or blood or maybe even something more holy. Can you imagine summer without that faint buzz, the background whisper? We are here while you pause at the windowsill or greet your children at the bus stop. While you bake cookies filled with finely chopped nuts, we speak the names of next year's seeds. This summer is long and the rain has yet to come, and I found 10 dead bees on my walk today. Take note, nothing is normal here. Without them, there might as well be no flowers. Take tweezers and try to go half as fast. When they stop, we stop. When their wings fall, we fall. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you have just covered me in goosebumps. I feel like, wow, I feel so privileged that you're sharing these poems that 
that one is so powerful. Like we can easily move through life thinking we're the center of things, not realizing that exactly that, if they stop, we stop and we're connected and we need them much more than they need us. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Will you read one more? Yeah, I will. I, I forgot to mention as well, I have a book of poetry coming out later this spring, yes. my first book of poetry. The title is What We Were Born For. Um, oh, wonderful. Will it be available on your website? It will be available on my website, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Will you read one more poem? Yes. For the grandmother teaching children how to plant seeds in the community garden. Just a little bit. They only need to go down an inch. Make a small hole. Use your pinky. Put the seeds in gently, gently. Elders pass on practice with the invocation of earth under fingernails. It doesn't matter so much if the rows are straight as long as we remember ourselves. We can spend a day like this, or a life, let afternoon pass under shifting light and swollen clouds. Plants need no permission, only our exhale, sunbeams, a thin veil of rain. How many more hopeful acts do we have left? After a thousand tragedies, sleepless nights staring up at the rafters, the ground beneath is waiting to begin again. The seeds will still be true. Wow. Wow. <laughs> You've really moved me, Emily. I feel, I feel really, I don't know, right now I've, <laughs> I just feel really emotional and vulnerable and I feel like we've, we've shared something really special and important and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I feel deeply connected to you now. It's been yeah. a joy to talk and, and be in discussion together. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Emily. Sometimes I don't really have the words to express the feelings that I have after an interview. Emily has a presence a way of being that's gentle and attentive and holds you in compassion while you're in conversation with her. In her work, she strives to create connection with community, with land, and within ourselves as humans, and connection with the human experience. And connection is a perfect word to describe what I felt at the end of this conversation. I didn't really have the words to speak about it. My heart was open and I felt vulnerable but really safe at the same time. This type of experience, this connection that we can make from one human heart to another, it's what life is really about. I'm so grateful to have had the chance to speak with Emily in this way and so grateful to you for being here to share this conversation with us. Emily's book of poetry, What We Were Born For, has been published and it's now available. Please be sure to check out the show notes to find a link to where you can purchase a copy for yourself. I'm excited to share also that Emily will be giving a live workshop at International Nature Journaling Week on the 1st of June, as well as teaching a class at the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference. Her class at Wild Wonder is called Creating Poetry from Journal Entries. I'm so excited to take this class. These two events are both coming up in June 2021, and you can learn more by visiting the show notes for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.